Hi there, my name is Stephen Hillian, and I am the head of data for Astronomer. Before I were the commercial developer of open source Airflow, before I really get into describing what Astronomer does and talk more about Airflow, let me tell you a little bit of sort of a day in the life, something that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, you know, my job is, like any other data science leader, is sort of supplying metrics and dashboards and reports and predictive models and statistics to my organization so that we can do our business better. Uh, and in order to do that, you know, my data scientists run hundreds of queries every day. They have to coordinate all of the data that they're producing. There are dependencies between these things. There are sequences of transformations and ingestion that they have to run. And eventually, of course, run those in order to produce the dashboards and then deliver those to the executives and the lines of business and so on. All that has to be coordinated and run on infrastructure that uh, uh, leverages relational databases and technologies like TensorFlow and uh, 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 Databricks and Spark and so on. So all that has to be coordinated. On this particular day, uh, one of our upstream, one of our core APIs, actually the API uh, into uh, one of our main repositories of information about what our product is doing, uh, that got changed. Nobody had told us. And so the downstream pipelines and queries that my team was running started breaking. It took us a while for us to figure out what was going wrong. In the meantime, we were no longer collecting data. So we had multiple hours uh, where we were just not ingesting the data into our warehouse for a wide range of queries that we were going to be running. Eventually, we figured out that this error was caused upstream by this change in the API. We fixed the call to the API, it was fairly easy to do, and we could start running things again. But of course, we've lost all that data, so we had to go back and rerun all of those queries, regenerate all those tables, and do that in the right order, and so on. But here's the thing. Nothing of what I've just described to you involved any human interaction whatsoever, with the only exception of being fixing that API and sort of understanding what was going on. But the running of the queries, the working out of the dependencies, the scaling of the infrastructure to handle all of this work, the pushing out to production models and production reports and statistics, even the cleanup after the error had happened, the backfilling of all of that data, all happened without me having to think about it for even a second. Um, I'm happy to say, as somebody who's been running data science teams for a good while now, um, since I started working at Astronomer, and even before, once I found out about Airflow, I really don't think about how to operationalize all the reports and models that my team produces. We just check in code, we have good code reviews, and it gets assembled into operational systems, and that's the secret ingredient that is Airflow that I want to talk about. Um, also, before I get started, I just want to make an observation, which is that you know I've worked with many data science teams over the years, and I think we're all just sort of getting going with ML ops. I think we're, we've now got a pretty good definition of what it means. Uh, and now we're starting to create technologies, both open source and commercial, to handle the operationalizing of data science and machine learning pipelines. So that's all good. Um, but again, we're still early on this journey, I think. But when I meet with mature organizations, um, large teams of data scientists that have built their own infrastructure, um, what I realize is that the way they define MLOps is not just about all those first class features that we think of in terms of uh, hyperparameter optimization, model deployment, model monitoring, model drift, governance, auditing, all those things that you expect in MLOps platform. What we think about also is the fundamentals of where does this stuff actually run? If you've got hundreds of data science and data engineering pipelines and machine learning pipelines that you need to run, it needs to run on some infrastructure, and ideally that's centralized so that everybody is coordinated, that this data science pipeline that rests on this data engineering pipeline are all running in the right order. You need to think about scalability. You need to think about the elasticity of the infrastructure that you're running so that you don't have to constantly be monitoring it. You need to think about errors and how things recover. Um, you need to think about, above all, how you take the ridiculously huge ecosystem of technologies that people use to do data science and bring that all together in a consolidated and coordinated way. So it's, it's great to think about those high-level MLOps features, but there is this secret ingredient, this platform, this foundation that you have to build first. And that, I'm here to argue, is where Airflow comes in. Okay, one more thing before I get started on actual slides. 
How many people here have heard about Airflow? Oh, that's pretty awesome. That's great. Um, what about astronomer? Okay. Talk to our marketing department. All right. Um, let me give you a quick introduction for those who don't know Airflow and for a few more who have not heard of astronomer, uh, what it is that we do. So I've already talked about sort of data pipelines. Traditionally, these have been done, uh, I'm talking, you know, you know, more than a few years ago before the advent of platforms like Airflow, it's sort of like a bunch of random scripts that are running maybe uh, in some cron job. Um, sometimes you actually have business analysts who are just hitting refresh on some report or just running a SQL query on their laptop, pretty primitive stuff. Um, it's not just the complexities, though, of scheduling. Uh, and some people have described Airflow as scheduling on steroids. It's much more than that. You've got this huge ecosystem of technologies that have to be integrated together. It's, it's highly complex. Uh, and data scientists tend to have a little bit of a, uh, a habit of just using whatever technology they want to use and standards be damned. And so there's just a lot of things that you have to integrate. So enter Airflow. Airflow was developed by Airbnb for managing all of their data pipelines, for generating financial end-of-year reports to daily reports that are being run by lines of business, uh, to predictive models that have been deployed to endpoints that are serving your website. Um, that was an enormous, complex set of data flows that they had to manage, and so the team there built uh, a management platform for data orchestration, which they called Airflow, which then was eventually open sourced, is now running within uh, as a top-level project in the Apache Software Foundation. And it's been doing pretty well. If you compare it to sort of similar platforms, uh, you see it sort of had a runaway success. Um, uh, the number of contributions uh, continues to go up. The number of downloads goes up almost exponentially. In fact, I think just recently, according to statistics that my own team generates, we have about 9 million downloads a month uh, of Airflow uh, and a very active community. Uh, and it's, a, I think, a very popular project. Okay, so what does Astronomer do? Well, were they really the commercial developer behind Airflow? Um, and we've been doing this for a number of years now to the extent that we're now making about 50% of all contributions to the Airflow code base. So it's still a very active and broad and public community. I was just at the Airflow Summit in London uh, a little while ago. Um, very active and dynamic and vocal Airflow community. Lots of features that we still need to build. Lots of demand for what we do. Um, but we are generating um, probably the majority of the commits at this point from our open source engineering team. Um, Aside from that core product that we're creating, um, the sort of standardized open source version, we've got a constellation of technologies, which we call the registry, if you go to our website, of integrations that you can plug into the Airflow platform for extending it to talk to third-party tools. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Most recently, we started to integrate Open Lineage, the Open Lineage standard, uh, into Airflow so that within an individual, what we call a DAG, direct acyclic graph, right, a data pipeline, uh, within a graph of, uh, of, of Airflow uh, tasks, you can obviously understand the lineage there, the, the, the visual nature of it uh, uh, that we'll see later uh, makes that very easy to do. But with Open Lineage, you can do that across your entire data ecosystem, uh, even things that are not running in Airflow, things running in, in, in Spark independently, in, Spark, in Databricks notebooks, for example, or things running in DBT. Um, uh, can all be united so that you have one view, uh, essentially a roadmap uh, for your entire data e ecosystem that leverages uh, instrumentation of platforms like Airflow. So we've made that a core part of what we do. We acquired the team that built Open Lineage, um, and uh, that's a very exciting new chapter in the company's history. But beyond just the software development we do around open source and the data lineage that we've started building in, we also have a managed service that we create uh, called Astro. Uh, runs in the cloud, it allows you to deploy your Airflow deployments uh, and your jobs uh, in a sort of a lights out way. Uh, so it's a managed service, uh, runs in the cloud, um, and allows you to have a sort of multi-tenant model where you can have different deployments that are used by different teams, all coordinated with a single visibility layer over that and all of the lineage built in. And we've got great enterprise adoption of the stuff that we do. Okay, let me talk a little bit more about um, how data science and machine learning 
works with Airflow. And I'll talk a little bit about what my own team does as an illustration uh, of this. So here's an example. We, as a data science team at Astronomer, are very concerned with understanding what it is the Airflow community is asking us about. And we get it. Um, we get the community to submit issues, of course, with GitHub issues. Um, and it's interesting for us, we get sort of certainly do dozens of these a day, feature enhancements and bugs and so on. And we'd like to sort of predisposition those for the support team and for the product team so they have some understanding of the complexity. So we do some natural language processing on these GitHub issues. So about 20,000 issues so far in the history of the project. And the output of this data science project is essentially a list of tasks and issues that have come in recently, and some sort of expectation of the complexity of that issue that we've gotten by doing this NLP. And we also not only deliver that to the business user, who's our support team and our product manager for open source Airflow, we also generate some model metrics for my team so that we can see how the models are doing. So some confusion matrices, ROC, all the usual stuff. So how do we do this? Um, well, we are constructing these data pipelines. This is the core part of Airflow. We call them DAGs, right? Um, and um, we've got three here that do the work of those models that I was just talking. So the first one does the model training. Very simple, it just calls an API to GitHub to get the issues, downloads, adds some features, does this usual TF-IDF scores on the text, and then trains a model on that and stores that in S3 for later retrieval. And we run that on sort of a weekly basis to refresh the model. Uh, sorry, the middle flow then takes that model, uh, makes sure it's up to date, validates it, runs up some basic metrics to make sure that there's been no model drift and it's not weaker. Um, and if it is weaker, we just fall back to the existing model, and if it, it's better, then we deploy the new model. So there's a little decision process there within that flow. And then finally, on a daily basis, we use that to score the new issues that are coming in, and so we pull the model in, in off of S3, run our production, uh, prediction, rather, and then serve those up in the UI that I just showed you. Pretty simple. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that we do. Um, uh, we're constantly monitoring what's going on on our own website and on the registry that I just mentioned. We're also looking at what our own customers are doing in order to understand, for example, um, what do people mostly do with Airflow? You can see here, um, top thing is just the Python operator, sort of the, the, sort of the, the workhorse of the Airflow world. Uh, Snowflake is very popular. Whole bunch of different technologies there that are very frequently used by our customers. Uh, and the Airflow community. And then also, what are people searching for on our registry? Uh, what are they searching for on the website? Um, so DBT is very popular, so how do you integrate DBT workflows with, uh, with uh, Airflow? Um, and similarly with things like S3 and Postgres and Sh Redshift and so on. It's a usually a good, pretty good leading I indicator for us of new integrations that we need to build. We do actually have all of those now, DBT. We have an integration. Uh, with that that we've developed in conjunction with them. Okay, so that's sort of a couple of examples of what my team does, running some predictive models, running these sort of reports. So how do we actually construct these DAGs that I was talking about? Um, actually, just one quick thing. So where do we get all the data for doing this? We've actually got dozens of different sources now. I think we're up to about 70 different sources. Uh, but here's a selection of the sort of sources that we bring into our Snowflake data warehouse. All of that is governed by our Airflow pipelines. Um, so this is what I tune into in the morning. I don't go there every morning. Um, but it sort of gives me an overall view of how my production deployments are running of my Airflow pipelines. Uh, and so this is all running in the cloud. And I can just click on these and navigate through to my dev or my production or my staging cluster. There's some basic analytics here about how the cluster is working. Um, so if at any point, for example, I might be starting to bump up against CPU limits or memory limits. We actually do auto-scaling, but it allows me to see maybe if I'm using up too much horsepower or not enough, and I need to go to the support team and request that we have a more powerful cluster. Uh, I can also see statistics on how many DAG runs have been failing, uh, are there things that are persistently not working. This is also where I would see sort of lineage charts to show me how my data is related to each other. Here within my Airflow deployment are all of the DAGs that I run. Um, so this is really... Uh, the sum total of the work that my data science team does. Uh, 
So if I'm producing a new predictive model or I'm generating a new dashboard that requires some queries, I can code those up in these DAGs. Each one of these is generally performing some particular function or some particular report or some particular model. Um, so for example, you see here the fifth one down there, our customer mart. So this is where we go out to the product, we determine our list of customers, we relate that to our Salesforce data so we understand something about their contracts, and then we store that in our warehouse as a clean record of what all the customers are that we have at, at Astronomer. Okay, so I want to take a step back a little bit and talk about how do my data scientists actually construct these pipelines, right? Because if you think about it, a data scientist is not necessarily concerned with operationalization. They're happy when their stuff gets into production, but they much prefer to spend their time exploring and improving their statistics and generating the queries and looking at the data and exploring and then running some Python code and then sort of kind of want to throw that over the wall. So I think there are different personas maybe in terms of users of a system like Airflow. And I'd like to talk through how it is that my data scientists themselves actually work with the system. So I've, I've taken a very simple DAG here. There's actually one that I developed myself. Um, and so I want to predict how many users we have on our new cloud deployment that we just rolled out a couple of months ago. So I get some user counts by calling an API, and I land that in my Snowflake warehouse. Uh, I create, uh, not every day do we create new users, maybe over the weekends or holidays, so I create a complete calendar and I do an outer join to join those together and then I run some Python code that does some curve fitting to predict where I'm gonna be in the next one, two, three, six months. So that's my very simple flow that I run here. Um, now the nice thing about Airflow, as many of you probably know, is that pipelines are not some YAML expression, it's not expressed in some sort of limited format, it's just Python code which is enormously flexible. It means that I can really just integrate with anything. I can write any code that I like, and I can also do all sorts of mind-bending tricks with my DAGs. For example, if I want, in fact, we do this, if I want to run a particular set of tasks for every single customer that we have, I can actually write a for next loop and generate that task within my Python file. So it's very flexible um, and, and malleable in that sense. So in the particular case of that DAG that I was just showing you that I created myself, you see here I'm using this thing called the Snowflake operator just to run some SQL, and then I'm using my Python operator that will call some Python function to build my model. It's pretty easy for me to create that Airflow code, and then all I have to do is check that into GitHub, and then we have some continuous integration that throws that up into my Airflow deployment, and it's running, and everything's great. And it generates this chart, and it shows me that, hey, we seem to be doing pretty well, and we've got lots of new users on the system. Here's a more complex DAG that was created by a real data scientist, not me, somebody on my team. This is Marion created this. Um, each one of these little light blue boxes can actually be expanded to show the box that is expanded there for organizations. Um, this is really where we get all of our product metadata, so you can see some sensors at the beginning here that are waiting for upstream DAGs to complete. And then I start off and I run a series of transformations that take that ingested data and turn that into something that's usable in my data warehouse. And there are all sorts of dependencies here, so I can't start calling, totaling how many deployments I have per organization until I know what my organizations are. So I'll do the organization metadata first and then I'll get my deployments and so on. So this is the DAG that Marion created. Marion never wrote a line of Airflow code to generate this DAG. We have a utility that we use internally um, that's actually open sourced as well that allows Marion just to check in some SQL files or check in some Python files and will automatically figure out the dependencies between those um, and throw that together and auto-generate that DAG, auto-generate that Python code to express that DAG and then that gets read by our continuous integration and then again submitted to, uh, to, our, to our Airflow deployment. So that's pretty cool. It means that if I want to, and I'm a hardcore Airflow developer, I can just write some code, and we often do that. Um, but what I can also do is use a mechanism like this. this. is a fairly common sort of design pattern that we see amongst Airflow users, that for their data scientists and their analysts, who are very much more used to writing SQL code, for example, and not sort of more complex Python code, having some sort of like mapping process to produce those Airflow DAGs is very common. And again, because it's all Python's code, very easy to do. But now there's a third mechanism that we have for authoring DAGs, which we're very excited about, which we've been developing at Astronomer. This is in preview right now, 
which is a notebooks interface for generating these data pipelines. Because we recognize that, especially for the members of my team, data scientists, they spend all of their lives in notebooks. And so if there's a notebook interface that allows them more easily to hand off what they've developed to the DevOps team, to the MLOps team, then they're more likely to operationalize their flows and they're more likely to be in the structure that my data engineering team needs to operationalize their flows. Because if you think about a data pipeline, you kind of want things to happen in the right order. You want the dependencies to be clear. You want things to be chunked up into sort of dis discrete, idempotent tasks. And the notebooks interface that we've created here feels and looks like any, just any other notebook, but it sort of encourages you to add the right structure. And you can actually run each of these things. I can run my Snowflake SQL. I can run my Python code. Um, and it will run that naturally. And then you just click at the bottom. There's my Python code, and I can run that, and I can see the prediction that it pr prints out at the bottom. And then it'll show me the graph that it's inferred from the SQL and Python code that I've entered. I can actually have cells refer to previous cells. Um, and then it actually generates the code um, for that DAG for me, and I can just check that into GitHub, and again, the CI process kicks off. So this is a very nice way that now someone like Marion, uh, who's very comfortable in notebooks, she can either check her stuff into GitHub um, but there's sort of a remove there from the end result. But what she can actually do is run her code now that she's maybe developed in, say, SQL worksheets on Snowflake or in a Jupyter notebook, but she can copy-paste this into here, and it automatically generates the DAG, and she can test that it's going to work. And that handoff process now between the data science team and the ML ops team or the, da the data ops team is very clean. Uh, we started using this with a number of our key customers, and there's a lot of excitement, especially for those that find that the handoff between the data science team and the ops team can sometimes be a little bit uh, cumbersome or fractious. So I hope I'm beginning to give you a little bit of a sense of why Airflow is a natural platform to use for data scientists, not just data engineers. Um, but let me think about it a little bit from the point of view of the challenges that a data science team faces. The first, as I've mentioned repeatedly now, is that data science teams tend to use a wide variety of, of particular technologies. Um, and getting things like notebooks into production can be very, very challenging. There's been lots of ink spilled about the challenges of doing that. We think we've come up with a variety of methods, special SDKs, our notebooks interface, that allows you to integrate all of that messiness uh, into a single common centralized platform uh, in a way that's fairly frictionless. Uh, another challenge that you face is that at a certain point your data science team begins to grow and you are now literally managing, uh, in some cases we have uh, companies that are managing literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pipelines, millions of tasks uh, a week. Uh, so coordinating those and having them, them run centrally in a way that the dependencies are managed and that you keep them up and running you have auto-scaling, and not really having to worry about or think about that, as I was indicating at the beginning of my talk, um, that is another advantage of Airflow. It's a centralized platform that allows you to deploy your pipelines in a very straightforward way, and then essentially forget about it. Now, as I also mentioned earlier, you can't actually forget about it because every so often something goes wrong. Uh, so you can manage disaster in this way. A big capability of the system is this ability to sort of like almost, it's a little bit of exaggeration, but almost do sort of self-healing when things go wrong. Uh, this concept of backfilling and going back, seeing which things have failed, and then only run the things that you need to run, uh, but have your data come back up to date is immensely powerful capability. Another challenge that data science teams face is the people look at the output of your model, or they look at this statistic, and they say, where did that come from? I don't believe it. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that our marketing team did the right thing with those leads, and that conversion rate can't possibly be right. Um, and so the ability to have lineage built into the system, so just by virtue of deploying your data and machine learning pipelines into Airflow, you get the lineage, so you see this metric came out of this data set that was generated by this long sequence and ultimately was ingested from this source, and being able to see where the errors are, um, that lineage capability is really powerful. Uh, I am often talking through the models that I produce with our business teams, and I'm literally able to show them how we arrived at our computations. And of course, it's very useful for debugging and, and so on. Um, another challenge that a data science team faces is, well, now do I have to use a new, learn a new technology to do this? I hope I've convinced you that because 
This can leverage the existing skills your team has. It's really just Python in the end, and we have built-in integrations for all the major databases uh, that you really don't have to learn anything new. And with the introduction of the notebooks interfaces and other SDKs that allow you to essentially just take Python functions and just tag them as a task for Airflow, uh, makes it very easy to author these things without learning a whole bunch of new Airflow rubric. And then finally, in terms of coming up to speed on this quickly, we've created our registry. I think I've got a little picture of it here. The registry has hundreds of examples of integrations, uh, hundreds of what we call providers that are integrations with third-party tooling, everything from uh, relational databases to data quality tools like Great Expectations to data processing like DBT uh, to machine learning tools like TensorFlow and Kubeflow and MLflow. Um, all of those are available there. Uh, along with guides, sample DAGs, and sample modules, that means you're never starting from a blank page when you're trying to build an operational pipeline for the data science work that you're doing. Okay. I'd like to finish by talking through a couple of real-world examples. I hope that what my team does is sort of vaguely realistic, uh, but I also want to talk about what some of our customers have done using Airflow. Um, so, first of all, you know, what does a typical machine learning workflow look like? Um, well, I think this is sort of like roughly accurate. You sort of like will ingest some data from various different sources. You'll explore that data, eventually produce some sort of statistic or model. Once you've refined that and got something that you think can make its way into production, you can push that out as a deployed model, and then you monitor that, you serve up your predictions, see how it's performing in the real world, and sort of repeat until, until you're done. Um, I think it's very natural not to focus so much on how you operationalize that exploratory data science uh, development work. Uh, maybe that's something that Airflow can help with, but that's not what I'm really going to talk about today. I really want to talk about the endpoints, which is once you've got that model and you want to deploy that and then just keep tabs on that, that's where we think Airflow can play a part, and that's where our customers typically use us. So ingesting the data, running your data engineering pipelines, training and retraining the model, uh, and deploying that and serving it and monitoring it over time. So here's an example from a major food delivery company. They have raw data that lands in S3. Uh, they transform that with a bunch of SQL scripts uh, in Amazon Redshift, essentially into a feature store. They run models, for example, using TensorFlow. They want that to scale, and so they deploy those in containers onto Kubernetes using the, uh, the Kubernetes pod operator that comes with Airflow. Uh, and then they store that model uh, in a version format in a bucket on S3. And they send a, a Slack message just with the latest model statistics to the development team. And then there's a separate flow that actually does the model execution. So it'll read the latest data uh, from uh, Redshift. It rereads the latest version of the model in from S3. It deploys that model out through SageMaker, I think for scalability reasons, and then writes the results of that uh, for scoring and for campaign execution and for product recommendations back to Redshift, and then run some extra, uh, with great expectations, some metrics checks to make sure the models are still accurate. And then again, sends a notification about that to Slack or a warning if the model seems to be getting worse. That's a pretty representative flow of the sort of thing that people do uh, with data science teams with Airflow. Here's another example, slightly different, some different technologies. This is from a international payments processor based in the UK. Um, and here they're doing data ingestion again from, well, in this case, from Snowflake, which they land on S3. They're building their models against that S3 data. They're using H2O, a combination of H2O and some MapReduce jobs in actually to for building their models. Uh, and then they, uh, not for building models, for building their features. Uh, again, they have a feature store that's in uh, S3. And they actually do their model training then with a combination of h 2 EMR or Amazon SageMaker, and then they push those models out uh, um, in SageMaker. Uh, and that runs on a daily basis, and they have about 100 models in production. So I'd like to just end by talking about why you would do this with Airflow, although I think that I've sort of made some, most of these points before. Uh, but Airflow is Python native. It's sort of the lingua franca of the data scientist. Uh, it's a common interface. It's sort of like a natural sort of meeting point between data scientists and data engineers. Because of the registry that I was showing you and all of the core providers that you get with Airflow, it has integrations with pretty much everything in the data science 
toolkit, uh, and so on. You can read this yourself. I'd like to take a step back. Uh, if you look at the users of Airflow, um, hundreds of thousands of users around the world who are using it for running these pipelines, uh, you see everything from high-tech companies, startups, uh, yeah, Stitch Fix, Lyft, uh, larger companies like Apple are literally running all of their data pipelines on Airflow, sometimes at massive scale. Um, and you also see major banks, for example, running predictive models, uh, uh, one that we're working with right now on some of those new features that I was showing you, including the build notebooks. Um, and one thing that I think is surprisingly common is actually, in many cases, the analytics teams of the data scientists are barely aware <laughs> that their operational code is running within the Airflow environment. Um, so it's possible the folks at the beginning of the talk that didn't put up their hands who hadn't heard of Airflow, it's possible that you're actually already using it and, and not even aware of it. Um, if you're not using Airflow, um, talk to your data engineers. Uh, chances are they'll be familiar with Airflow already. And they're used to using it for data pipelines. And in a sense, a machine learning pipeline is just a data pipeline. It's still a sequence of tasks that is processing data. Of course, there's some extra complexity. But it is a data pipeline, and Airflow very naturally fits. And your data engineers will be delighted to take all the wonderful work that your data science teams have done and make that truly operational. Um, now, of course, again, it is more complex. Right? Machine learning pipelines aren't exactly the same as just a, a pure ETL-type pipeline. But we have integrations with all of the components of the modern MLOps stack, including things like MLflow. Um, and so uh, it's very easy to operationalize those and you know, do your model experimentation and make sure that you're storing the metadata along the way. Um, so that's if you're not using Airflow right now. If you are using Airflow and you're interested in learning a little bit about what Astronomer has been working on, especially this idea of making that handoff between the data science team and the data engineering team more frictionless, uh, using some of these SDKs and these authoring capabilities around Airflow, then come and see us. Uh, Astronomer is in the booth in the tech showcase. You can come along and have a drink with myself and Viraj, uh, who's one of our co-founders standing in the back there, and ask us lots of questions about Airflow and what Astronomer is doing with the open source framework and with some of these authoring capabilities. We'd love to chat to you. OK, that's all I have today, but I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, maybe come to the mic. I put some mics there. Say that again. Why not step functions? I think um, I, you know I'm not an expert in 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 the Amazon step functions. Um, I think my sense is that we're dealing with a level of complexity in terms of DAGs. Um, that would be difficult to do with step functions. Uh, Viraj, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Maybe you can, it's not an area where I'm sort of an expert. You can come to the microphone. Um, I think I'd think of it less as like airflow or and more of an airflow and. So if there's logic that you're comfortable with expressing in step functions or is already there, awesome, leave it there. Um, you can use Airflow to call your step functions and then downstream things that are happening or upstream things that are happening. You can have one layer of observability for it all. Hi. Um, so one question I had was uh, in a s enterprise setup where you have many, many pipelines running and say they belong to different teams, what's the scheme to isolate the role privileges per team. Like for if you take the example of your snowflake, how do we ensure that each user gets their own credentials and they don't have the permissions to use somebody else's credentials? Sure, yeah. So this is definitely a feature of the astronomer managed services that you have this essentially sort of multi-tenant model where you can have departmental workspaces. So you have the notion of an organization. Um, within that, you have workspaces that are maybe sort of at the departmental level. Um, and within those workspaces, you have various Airflow deployments uh, that each have a collection. You know, you might have like a dev and a staging and production deployment, much as I was showing you before. Um, each of those deployments and those workspaces can share a common set of variables and secrets and connections and so on that then the team can use. Um, and then you can have sort of basic RBAC 
um, uh, controls about what people are able to do within those Airflow deployments. So for example, the way that we manage this is that my team has its own workspace and we also have a workspace where our community team and our marketing team and so on uh, uses. They were all going against the same warehouse, but we might have different connections that sort of at the deployment or workspace level. Um, so for example, my team um, has general access to our warehouse and there is a single connection and a service account that we would use for reading from the, we wouldn't have individual accounts being used within those production deployments, there's a, a general service account. And as soon as you deploy your pipeline, uh, it is running under the auspices then of the, that service account for calling that API or writing to that database. Um, our HR team actually has a more limited set of DAGs that they run, but they have much greater access to some of the data that otherwise we can't see. So information about sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of people's salaries and counts by department, that sort of thing. Um, so that sort of departmental model is generally done at sort of that workspace and, and deployment level. So you're suggesting a workspace model would help with this situation, right? For sure, yeah. Is yeah. that uh, on astronomer only? Or? That is an astronomer. I mean, that's one of the reasons why uh, organizations do come to us is because they've created um, a lot of airflow deployments and it's kind of becoming a little bit crazy and they have no sort of overall, so managing things at the deployment level is fine and airflow does a great job of that and we've also open sourced some components that make that a little easier to do. We have our own command line interface that make it a lot easier to develop with, with airflow at a single deployment level. But as soon as you have many of those deployments and you need coordination and visibility around those as well as the lineage aspects, I think that's really where that sort of more enterprise nature of it is where astronomer comes in. That's sort of, really the origins of the company, really, because we were seeing, you know, Airflow was already very popular before we came along, uh, but it can get a little messy in terms of managing those large-scale uh, data ecosystems. Hi, uh, thanks for the great presentation. So uh, we are using Airflow to crunch petabytes of satellite data, but now we are thinking about Prefect because we have some issues with the Airflow. So uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on Prefect as an alternative to Airflow? So why staying with Airflow? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, I won't focus on Prefect specifically, but some of the others, Prefect X, and sort of try and sum summarize those. I think that they definitely have some advantages. Uh, I think that uh, it's true that historically, for example, Airflow has not done a great job of being sort of data aware. Um, and there are some sort of general authoring capabilities um, that we've only started introducing really in the last couple of years to make it easier to, to author things within Airflow without having to understand a lot of the, the boilerplate, um, having more sort of Pythonic interfaces into construction of DAGs. I think the, the thing, honestly, I would say is that um, in terms of the maturity of the platform, if you just look about the level of activity, I mean, it's only one indicator, but I think it's a pretty telling indicator. If you look at the level of activity around the open source communities, it's just nowhere near at that same level. Uh, Airflow has been around for longer, has sort of gotten enough traction that it's some, become sort of self-sustaining in that sense in terms of feature enhancements, in terms of the developer community. So just in terms of the number of PRs and commits and feature requests and so on, it's just a much livelier community. Um, I also think that, um, we are now catching up with some of those authoring and data handling capabilities. I would say we're sort of on par there now with some of our competitors. Um, uh, not completely, but I think we're making good progress there. Um, and I also think that what Astronomer brings into it as sort of a commercial organization is uh, a level of um, sort of enterprise features, uh, you know, that I was just sort of referring to in my, pr in my previous answer. Um, I'm not going to get into a feature-by-feature feature comparison with, with Prefect itself, but, um, um, but I think that my simplest answer would just be sort of the level of the maturity of the code base, frankly. Thanks a lot. Yeah, but if you've got like, specific things that you're wrestling with or sort of features that you're looking at, you know, come and talk to us afterwards. We're happy to sort of talk through those here. Is there a managed version of Airflow? I'm sorry? Is there a managed version of Astronomer, like managed like, version of Airflow? Like managed cloud version? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really what we have created. We call that Astro, and that's available from Astronomer. And so that runs right now exclusively on AWS. Um, and, uh, and so you can essentially bring your Amazon account and all the connections to your various third-party systems, and then you can deploy that, and we can provision that very straightforwardly uh, on AWS and have that running in the cloud. Will it work in like you know complex way? Like you know when we are talking about 400 plus accounts in a large organization? Oh yeah, certainly we have we have very large 
accounts. I mean, I, I didn't spend much, I didn't want this to be too salesy. I didn't uh, mm -hmm. want to spend too much time on the sort of the customer slides, but we certainly have organizations that consist of hundreds of users. And as I said, sort of, I, I don't know what our largest account is, but certainly, uh, you know, we have customers like uh, 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 Walmart and Condé Nast, for example, that are running both of our on-premise and our in the cloud managed version that are running with hundreds of users and tens of thousands of DAGs running a month. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, can you, can you just explain the, uh, the compute aspect of it? Um, I, I'm familiar with something like Databricks, which is trying to move into this managed workflow space. Uh, they obviously have very opinionated compute. It runs on EC2s. Yes. And it's Spark, mostly, and some SQL, whatever. Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of curious how, how the compute aspect gets managed. Is it so pluggable? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, in some ways, we, want, we like to encourage a model where you're not exhausting commute with Airflow itself because Airflow should be calling out to Databricks and should be calling out to Snowflake and Redshift and EMR and so on. Uh, and so the, the Python tasks themselves should have, in theory, sort of fairly low overhead. But it never happens that way, of course. People get lazy or they want to take advantage of the fact that this is this very Python-oriented uh, pipeline. Uh, and so what we have um, uh, is a capability that you can run those DAGs in, a, in an environment that essentially can auto-scale. So we're running that on, say, a Kubernetes cluster, uh, most typically. And the, the DAGs then get deployed into that cluster um, and can run there. And we're, we have features where you can assign individual tasks or DAGs to a particular worker queue and that worker queue will have characteristics associated with it in terms of the size of the compute environment and the amount of CPU and memory that's allotted to it, and then that'll get sort of spun up and shut down. Um, so there's, there's a variety of different configurations that we use for, for running those deployments, but if you look at, for example, our cloud deployments, it's typically similar to what I just mentioned there. Um, and uh, what we try to do then is to avoid having too much sort of idling uh, in terms of those deployments by having that, that, that level of scalability. Um, uh, there's also sort of new features that we started adding. So, for example, if you're running a long-running Spark job, for example, um, it's great because the compute is now in Databricks and you're just paying Databricks for, for that work. But still, historically, Airflow would sort of wait and sort of be waiting for that job to finish. And so you're using a certain amount of compute for that. So we've now introduced the notion of asynchronous operators can essentially spin that stuff off, go to sleep, and then just get called when the, when the job is finished. Um, there are other architectures that we do support in terms of how the compute gets handled. But broadly speaking, um, again, Astronomer tries to do a good job of allowing you to define a cluster with the appropriate horsepower for your particular organization and then deploy your Airflow deployments and your DAGs into that environment in a way that scales in an appropriate way and doesn't use up too much compute and will sort of take care of that for you. Thanks. Uh, you said Astronomer is on AWS, and is it on the AWS marketplace that we could? Uh, yes, it is, yeah. And how does that compare to the MWAA on AWS? Um, I would say that, uh, I would say that ours is more richly featured. Um, for example, the, the lineage capabilities that I was talking about is something that you won't get there, and I think that, um, because Astronomer is a core committer uh, at the levels that I was talking about earlier, um, a lot of the features that we offer, for example, the async operators that I was just talking about, will be available within that environment uh, long before they're available, say, in some of the other managed Airflow instances, including the one from Google as well. Um, so I think it's sort of a, a little bit of a, a more fully featured environment for running these uh, uh, and it's a pretty common sales motion for us, and one where we've had sort of very straightforward conversations with the, with the AWS team, where uh, organizations may get started on MWAA and then move over to Astronomer. That's a fairly common sales motion for us. Uh, we know that MWAA has some limitations in terms of uh, you know, where the, the script resides. It's enforced that the script be on S3. Uh, I believe Astronomer has uh, integrations with GitHub directly as Yeah, I mean, most of our organizations are running uh, uh, CICD so that, they're, they're, just as I was showing you in that example, so your, your DAGs are actually getting checked into Grit, GitHub, and then we're deploying them directly from there. Uh, also, I think um, 
uh, you know, upgrades are a big thing for us, right? I mean, you know, there are new versions of Airflow coming out pretty regularly. And the ability that we have an astronomer to essentially do in-place upgrades with, so that you don't have to move those scripts around, you don't have to move your deployments around or your metadata is, is a key feature there. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I have used uh, Airflow in the past for uh, different kind of uh, general workflow, so it's a great tool. Uh, so my question is, uh, how do you compare Airflow versus uh, like Kubeflow? Since this is a talk, this is a conference is more about uh, machine learning. So from yeah. machine learning kind of workflow workloads, how would you compare to Kubeflow, which is more designed for kind of uh, machine learning specific workloads? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, it's actually something we were having a discussion about earlier today. Um, First of all, it's worth mentioning, we have examples of Kubeflow integrations, I think are available on the registry. We certainly do for MLflow. Um, so that's something you can take a look at. I think the way that I view it at a high level is that Kubeflow is very specifically focused on machine learning pipelines and is, um, black box is maybe a little bit of an, an exaggeration, but is more limited in the scope of what it's focused on, which is great. And so if you want to use Kubeflow for running PyTorch and doing model experimentation and model serving, that is a great thing to do, and you can actually call that as part of a larger workflow um, from within Airflow. And that's something that many of our organizations actually do with, uh, slightly different, but with both MLflow and with Kubeflow, where they will have Airflow tasks that are calling out to those to actually do the, the final model training or the model serving. But of course, there is usually some data and ETL process or feature generation process that are upstream on that that may be running, for example, in, in Spark or maybe running in uh, Redshift or in a r database, there's, there's usually some sort of data pipeline that precedes the work that's happening in Kubeflow, and so knitting those together. Um, I would say um, more ambitiously and more excitingly, I, I view a lot of the capabilities that Kubeflow, frameworks like Kubeflow can offer in terms of metrics tracking, uh, in terms of hyperparameter optimization, uh, in terms of, of course, integration with, with frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow and so on. Uh, we think that we can handle that stuff ourselves pretty well. Either we already do in terms of some of those integrations or in terms of things like model metrics tracking. Um, we're happy to do that by calling out to services like MLflow, but I think watch this space because we'll, we'll be trying to do more of that stuff ourselves as well. But we're certainly perfectly compatible with Kubeflow and a lot of people use that within the context of Airflow because we view Airflow as a little bit more broader in its remit. Thank you. Thanks. I was uh, interested in some of the, uh, uh, the the notebook capabilities you're talking about. Oftentimes, yeah. that the handoffs between data science and engineering can be a challenge. They're yes. working in notebooks, engineering is working in Python. Just interested how that coordination has happened with the notebook integration you're working on. Yeah, we were just um, running a workshop with this with a, a investment house in in New York just a few days ago, and. They have a, a whole set of SQL and Python scripts that they've developed and just legacy scripts that they've run, running, and I think they run them in, I'm actually not even sure, Autosys maybe, or maybe they're just cron jobs. Um, pretty messy, and so they're looking at that notebook interface as a way that they can take that stuff and move it, a, a lot of that code is sort of highly fragmented as well, and essentially move that code into Airflow as sort of a more robust management platform for their DAGs, just the airflow advantage, but using the, the notebooks interface as a way of saying, well, we've got all this code. This allows us more easily to sort of chop that up into manageable chunks and then test that out, make sure it's still producing the right results, and then you hit a button, and that basically produces the DAG and checks that into source control. So I think it's, it's early days yet. We're going to see if we can be ambitious to say that we want to create a notebooks interface that is the way that you build operational data science and machine learning pipelines. Right now, at the very minimum, I would say that the notebooks interface allows you to take code that data scientists and machine learning engineers and data engineers has developed independently, say, in your, in your red, at a Redshift prompt or at a, a Jupyter Notebooks, and essentially copy-paste that into that notebooks interface. But it's not just a, a sort of static thing where you then say, well, there's my DAG. You, historically, the way that people have done this, right, is they've said, I've got a bunch of code that's been developed in my notebooks interface or has been developed in my SQL worksheet. And I'm now gonna copy that into a Python file and wrap that up in the, the Redshift operator or in the S3 operator or whatever. That's fine, but it's very error prone because now how do you run that, right? Well, you have to deploy that to Airflow, make sure that works. 
The notebooks interface allows you to essentially run it as an Airflow DAG, but you don't know you're running it as an Airflow DAG. You feel like you're running it as a sequence of cells in a notebook. You verify that the numbers are right, and then you check that in and you're done. So it's, I think it's really promising. It's still early days. The notebooks interface is, is still just in preview. But the, the sense that we're getting from our customers uh, uh, is that um, it, it makes that handoff a lot more straightforward. And, it's, and the notebooks interface is also integrated with the Airflow deployment. So if you've got connections and variables and secrets and so on that you've defined in your production or your dev Airflow deployment, those are already available and easily available then to the notebooks developer. That's a very nice feature, I think, because often when the data scientist is over here and she's doing her work and she's like copying URLs to a database instance and then hands that over to the, the, the Airflow engineer, they're, they're just divorced you know, the tendrils that connect that to the rest of your production environment are just divorced and they're separated and they're different. Whereas if the data scientist from the beginning is using the same connections that the DevOps and data ops people are using, then that makes things a lot more straightforward. I'm very excited about our notebooks interface. <laughs> uh, so this might be more uh, philosophical, but you showed that there was, uh, you know, like this, the use case where there was tens or hundreds of DAGs in, in the account but it, it seems like you're also demonstrating that you have the ability to generate the DAGs as code and maybe manage it as code. So like, what's the inflection point or the point in which you transition to more of like a DevOps mentality where you're managing everything as code? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, I think my sense is that as soon as you have a larger organization where you have a factory, if you like, of uh, you, you have a, a, a team of data scientists who is are doing their work, and then you have a separation of concerns, I guess, between the work that the data scientists are doing and then the work that the, the, the ops team is doing to actually operationalize those things. And it's different people doing that work. That's the point at which often it's useful to have an interface that somewhat separates the data scientists who just have to worry about what they worry about from the work of the ops teams, right? So if you look at smaller teams, like my own, for example, Often, we have data scientists who are just writing Python DAGs, and they're perfectly happy doing that. Um, but as the team matures, I think, I think they, they want this sort of separation of concern. So I think it's a question of the, the degree to which you've operationalized your data science pipelines and the size of the organization. Where exactly that happens, I, I know. I, th I think we're still figuring that out. Thanks. Yeah. But you see this all over. You know, like I have friends who work at you know, Netflix and LinkedIn, whatever. And in almost all of these cases, right, they have some mechanism that essentially allows the data science teams not to have to think about the operational aspects uh, to, a, to a certain extent. Um, they think about them in terms of like, does this scale well? Does it handle PII properly or whatever? But in terms of like how it actually gets pushed into production and from dev to stage or whatever, you kind of want to make that as, tra as sort of separable and sort of structured as possible. You mentioned um, the open lineage and lineage in general. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that, how that works, and maybe give some examples on it? Yeah, sure. So um, what open lineage does, in the context of Airflow at least, and you can sort of map this to other frameworks as well, but it essentially can listen in on uh, the tasks within a DAG. So for example, I showed you those Snowflake operators. Um, a Snowflake operator eventually will send some SQL over to the database uh, and maybe get a little bit of a preview back. But it's essentially maybe creating a new table. So Open Lineage can listen in to those statements, and equally well, they could be like a Spark job, or it could be a Python data frame, or it could be PySpark. Um, but the SQL one is particularly easy to, to imagine. So you sort of unpack that SQL, and so there's capabilities where we can actually unpack that SQL, or we can query the database and look at the information schemas there. But we know what table was created by that SQL statement, and we know what upstream tables and views it used to create itself. So now you have this sort of like these, these two vertices and an edge where the vertices are the upstream table and the new table you just created and the edge is the SQL that created that, right? So you can listen in on those operators um, and essentially send that metadata to say this table was created from this table by this query and you send that metadata up to, through the open lineage standard uh, to um, Marquez is the sort of the coordinator of all of that open lineage metadata. Um, so what the open lineage team is they've built those listeners 
for a large selection of the types of tasks that people will run in something like dbt or in Airflow or dbt running in Airflow. Um, they allow you to store that metadata and then allow you to query that afterwards through a nice UI that allows you essentially to say, search for the, um, you know, the customer metrics table. Um, look at that number. Well, where did that come from? That came from here and that came from here and that was ultimately ingested from Salesforce and from S3 and so on. You can trace that all back, even if that crosses multiple DAGs or multiple deployments, right? So it's a mechanism for listening into data pipelines unwrapping the queries and the jobs that have run, figuring out what the nodes and vertices of that graph of data sets is, storing that as metadata that you can query later, and then plopping a nice UI in front of that so that you can do things like um, figure out where this metric came from or why did this break. Does that, does that answer your question? Great. Okay, great. Well, good timing. We were just about wrapping up. Thanks so much for your questions. Um, they were great, and it was nice to chat to you all.